Hello, 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 and welcome to the Daily News, everybody. It is Marshall Ferguson at TSN underscore Marsh, Mike Daly at Daily News 8 on Twitter. And for the right price, he can be yours this CFL season. That's right. Hey. Give, <laughs> give Mike a call. I feel like we're doing a dating show here. Right. <laughs> right. How many GMs do you think just pick up this uh, podcast and go, hey, I wonder if... Uh... Hey, if there's one thing oh. I've learned about doing digital audio, it's really accessible. Right. Anybody yeah. can listen to it anywhere. And you never know who's listening because sometimes I do get the odd DM from somebody in the league and they're like, hey, I really enjoyed that sit down interview you did with blank. And I'm like, don't you have something better to do with your time? <laughs> Should you be scouting maybe <laughs> or game planning? I know you have a game tomorrow. <laughs> they're like, no, 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 no. You know, I, I, I you know, I had some downtime and I was walking the dog. And I'm like, right. Yeah. 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 And this is the podcast you went to because it's your number one podcast, which hey, if, if we are, we appreciate <laughs> hey, it. Thank, hey, thank prob- hey, probably is. There you go. Uh, <laughs> I do want to say thank you, as always, to our good friends over at Fox 40. They are the ones that make all of this possible for us. And, of course, you can use the promo code CFP15 to get 15% off on your entire order over at fox40shop.com. They got custom logoed Fox 40 whistles, gear, coaching boards, and more. CFL Draft is coming up next Tuesday, which I guess this is mm-hmm. airing on Saturday. So it'll be this Tuesday, this coming Tuesday. Um, I will be on the panel Oh, I love it. On TSN with Dwayne Ford, Davis Sanchez, uh, and Farhan Lalji. Uh, it's going to oh. be the, the four of us. So we're going to be on TSN for the first two rounds, and then we're going to be on TSN.ca for the rest. If you would like alternative and at times better coverage, uh, Wade, Wade and Connor from All Canadian will be throwing a draft party, I believe, on our CFP, either Twitch or YouTube or wherever they're going to end up hanging out. But CFP is going to have live draft coverage for you as well coming up, which is uh, exciting. And 74, yeah. it's 74 picks for me to not make a total ass of myself, Mike. What do you think the chances are that I get through all 74 having something for all 74? Well, I was just going to give the over-under at... <laughs> Is there going to be a mistake made over under seven picks? <laughs> let's. Uh, <laughs> I think that's where, if we're stuck in Vegas odds, probably seven. Is there any just... tough names coming up? You know what? The names I'm actually okay with. The one that scares me is that I'm doing on the same day, which this gives you a sense for where my mind is at right now. Um, I'm doing live at noon Eastern this coming Tuesday, the CFL Global Draft. From, oh the, from the CFL offices in downtown Toronto, which for any of you connecting the dots, I live in Hamilton. Uh, that means that I will be going in early to the CFL offices in downtown Toronto doing the global draft live stream on CFL.ca and their YouTube page, I believe, uh, and then traveling over to Agent Court, in which point the draft doesn't start until 8 p.m. and then we'll be on until about 1 and then driving back to Hamilton, and then guess what? It's East West Bowl week. Ooh, hello, we'll have to get some of those Fox Forty whistles and just <sighs> hire someone to blow it right in your ear. No, I keep feel, you awake the whole time. Honestly, like just bringing my Husky Sky and like strapping a whistle in front of her mouth, so that every time she breathes, I just get like a little <laughs> little pop to wake, oh. wake me up and keep me going. But uh, pick seventy five. <laughs> Uh, This week, right here on the Daily News, we have got for you Adrian Tracy, who uh, we just finished doing the interview with him. It was a very enjoyable, super well-spoken guy, um, somebody that you got to know really well from your time in the Ticats locker room. But I I wanted to ask you um, about a specific quote that he had in this interview that jumped out to both of us, which was the idea of essentially he he just had his first child it's his daughter um three and a half months old and he was talking about the idea of i want her to see that i am all of these things that i i'm telling her that you you need to use almost your kids as a mirror it's like a reflection of yourself where it makes you self-assess your own values and what you're putting out into the world that drove him to come out of pseudo retirement and join the Toronto Argonauts this year. I thought that was a super interesting quote that said so much about him. Yeah. And it's one of those things that, you know, didn't really catch me off off guard because of the type of person he is. And you'll see the type of person is when you listen to this episode, but um, that makes so much sense because you hit this retirement stage or this, you know, this weird limbo stage and you go, 
okay, I'm going to have, I have kids. They're going to grow up. They're going to ask me about what I did. And, you know, he decided on his own terms. It's like, okay, I'm done playing football. I'll go look for something else. Maybe, you know, COVID world, all that kind of stuff. Stop me. And then you kind of take a step back and you go, but that's kind of in my mind. And maybe he didn't think this way, but the way I kind of took it is that's kind of giving up. And do I want my daughter or in my case, my son to think, oh, but dad, you gave up, Mm -hmm. you know what I mean? Or you just decided you didn't want to do it, but you said you love football. So why wouldn't you keep doing it? And it's like, I think that's probably where his mind ended up working itself around to. And he kind of dives into a little bit more, but it was like, as soon as he said it, I was like, yeah, that makes complete sense. I understand that completely. And, and, and that would drive you to get back and, you know, kind of get back to what you like doing. Yeah. It's interesting hearing you say it too, from your perspective, because it makes me connect the dots on uh, like tiger, like tiger woods. Like he, if you, I'm sure there's quotes out there in interviews that he's done where he's like, yeah, I want my kid to see me or LeBron, like the top of the top of the top, even the greatest athletes of our generation, they still look at their kids and say like, what, what do I want my kids to know about me through my sport? Cause yeah, LeBron's all time points and all time assists and all, t- all these things that he's going to be in record books forever and ever. But the thing that matters most to him is well, I want Bronny to see my work ethic. So I want to play a year with him in his rookie year. I'm going wherever my son goes in the NBA, whatever team drafts him, they get me now, whether or not that it can actually happen. We'll see. Right. But, but he well, said he like, make it happen. yeah, it's exactly. I mean, he controls the whole NBA, uh, <laughs> but except, except he can't make the playoffs. Uh, but the idea, mm. the idea of which by the way, LeBron live tweeting the playoffs is so sad. That's it's, fantastic. <laughs> fantastic. He's a James uh, Adore fan. He's yeah. so angry. But the idea of, of him saying, no, I want my son to see me firsthand in the building every day, laying down the work ethic. It's like, that means as much to him as the, the rings and all of the other things. Cause I'm pretty sure Michael Jordan has more championships. I'm pretty sure LeBron's not getting there, but Michael Jordan never got a chance to play on the same NBA team with his son. Like that's something that sticks with you. That means more at a, at a very, very human level. And even I'll mention something personal from my side is that like my son is 19 months now. And I was given an opportunity. I'm, I'm interested in fitness and in the off season, teaching, coaching, personal training, that kind of stuff, like maybe moving in towards that direction on top of a whole bunch of other little side bits and projects I got going on. But, um, and one of the things that I got offered was uh, teacher training to do bar, like bar mm-hmm. classes. And people might not understand what bar classes are. A lot of people think it's just ballet. It's not. It's not easy. No, I know that. I know that for sure. It's literally just like a lower body burnout workout that happens to have a literal bar that you hold on to at times to be able to support yourself and balance. But I found this workout. It was great. The thing is, when I go into these classes, it's like 90% like 50 plus year old women. And for me, I got offered this teacher training thing because they're like, hey, like you could really bring a different demographic and you bring your own style to this. And we think you'd be good at this because of your background as an athlete and all the rest. And I had the thought go through my head again, totally different situation, but same kind of base mechanic of your mind of, you know what? I don't want my son to ever think I can't do this because guys don't teach bar. It's like, right. I-, I like the idea of doing that. It's fitness. It shows that anybody can do anything at any time to try and make themselves better. The stereotypes, the whatever, who gives a damn? It doesn't matter if we're all putting in effort and we're all getting healthier and be- becoming better people that makes me happy. And I want him to know that. Therefore, you know what? Yeah, I'm going to do this teacher training. So it's amazing how we use that mirror. And for Adrian, that drives him into a very competitive situation in the Toronto Argonauts on their defensive line. Yeah. And, and you hit it right on the head there. It's, you know, until you have, until you have kids, you kind of go through this trajectory of, okay, I want to just make, the league, or I want to just start doing this for myself. You know what I mean? This is cool. I want to do this. This is fun. And then you go, okay, now I want to be really good. You get to this point where you're like, okay, I want to be like the best in my position, all this kind of stuff. And then I noticed once you have kids and a lot of guys say this is it's, Oh, now I want to show them. Mm -hmm. I want to show my kids what I can do and the effort it takes and, and you know, what goes into it and how hard I work and, I want them to see that. And it's like this weird trajectory to all of a sudden now you're not really doing it for yourself as much anymore. And you're doing it to be like, listen, this is what kind of effort it takes to put into stuff. 
And for Tracy to come back out of retirement, that's a hard thing to do to yeah. go into retirement to, you know, it says it stays in shape and stuff, but, and then just to get back into football, that's a huge decision for him to make. And you can just tell that, you know, he's excited for it. And the competitor that he is, is he's going to be good at it. It's going to yeah. be easy for him. Yeah, it's going to be fun. He cares a lot about Hamilton as you're here in this interview as well. And he's playing for the Argos. That's going to be fun too. Because you got Speedy and, and Adrian Tracy coming in on Labor Day potentially. It's like, oh man, <laughs> I God, I hope I got that game on TSN. That'd be so much fun to be able to call those guys coming back in. But the last thing I'll say on this and the parenting angle and the maturity that you gain from it that he talks about. Um, you know, we mentioned the NBA kind of in passing, but from all the reporting that I've I've read and seen. I genuinely believe, and this is such an underrated kind of looking back kind of thing, but I genuinely believe that the Raptors do not win the championship that they did that so many people will remember forever and ever if Kyle Lowry doesn't have kids. (laughs) Because Kyle Lowry has very openly talked about the fact that like, yeah, was kind of a shit guy, was kind of selfish, was kind of out of shape, was kind of this, like just all of these different things. And then he had kids and it was like, oh, grounded. Right. And, all, and all of a sudden he was pros pro and he becomes the greatest rapper of all. I mean, even DeRozan and having his kids growing up with Lowry's kids. Yeah. DeRozan left and Kawhi ended up coming in. Um, <laughs> I don't know if Kawhi has any kids. I don't know if Kawhi talks to women. I don't know if Kawhi talks at all. <laughs> uh, talk to all. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, I do know that it, it has a real impact on people. And, uh, and I think that, that you will hear that in this interview with Adrian Tracy. So uh, let's, let's get to it for you here. What do you got Mike on the way out? I just, uh, and it's funny with Adrian because it's, you know, we could have had a conversation with this guy for five hours straight yeah. and, you know, we'll get him back on because he is just such a, such an inspiring dude, but I mean, enjoy this and, you know, I can't wait to see him play. That's all I could say. Adrian Tracy, what's up, man? How you been? What's going on, Dales? How you doing, man? Man, it's good to see you. I mean... Um, you know, I was really excited when you said that you'd be all right to come on this podcast because I know, you know, from our time playing together, we've had some pretty good conversations and, you know, you, you're a pretty in-depth thinker. So I was like, okay, you know what we need to do? We need to get Adrian Tracy on here so that we can chat a little bit of stuff. But oh, no, man, I appreciate you guys having me, to be honest. Marshall, it's, it's a pleasure to be on here with you as well. And like you said, we've been teammates for quite some time and, no different than us having a locker room chat, so I'm I'm ready to get started. So let's jump let's jump right into it. I mean, listen when when I saw that Adrian Tracy was deciding to retire, one of the most competitive people that I know. I mean, we're we're talking we're talking pickup basketball at Marsh. These pickup basketball games, man, we'd be showing up, oh. <laughs> and it would be like we were playing the Grey Cup to win this. Yeah. And I remember, and I'm, I was like, this guy. And I knew you on the field, and that made sense. And uh, when you showed up and, you know, we were playing pickup basketball, competitive, and you decided, you know what, COVID, all this kind of stuff, not feeling it. What was what was that decision like? Because I'm telling you, yeah, I went through a lot of people's heads, a lot mm-hmm. of people's heads, and you just kind of decided to do it. So what, what was that decision like? Why why did you decide to make that at that time? Um, uh, Like you said, it was the time. Uh, I thought – at that particular moment, my wife had a discussion and we just sat down at where we were both at. It just was the right thing for me to do. Um, you know, I was coming off of 2019 uh, with elbow injury, had to have surgery, ended my, my season prematurely and uh, had about a year and a half to kind of see what else was out there besides football. Um, and then also, uh, you know me, I'm a man of principle man of faith and there were some things that were going on on the league side that I couldn't really get behind uh or support or at least put my you know mental physical and uh health you know in that position and not have certain I don't want to say guarantees but certain things that made me feel a little bit safer and secure so um like I said this conversation with my wife we had just got married and wanted to see what what else was was out there after you know playing for at that time 10 years um, so yeah, the time I thought was right for me to, to hang up the cleat, so to speak. And so that's kind of what went into my decision. Yeah. And I mean, I want to, I do want to dive into that, you know, cause you've been a part of the PA for a while and you've been pretty active in that, and that, you know, it's a, it's a tough thing to do 
to Mm -hmm. be on that PA side and see what's going on. But okay. So you get hurt. Right. And what a lot of people might not know is that was huge for our team. I mean, you were having such a good season, you know what I mean? And something small like that happens. And I mean, you know, you were playing at a different level in terms of just, like I said, your competitiveness and how much you were just kind of wrecking the games really anytime you would play. So that was, that was a blow to the team and, and to all of us in the locker room, especially, but for you then to decide, okay, I'm going to retire. I'm going to stop playing. And then now fast forward it a little bit and be like, you know what? I'm not done. I'm not mm-hmm. over this. I still got, you know, whatever juice you got left because you're going into what? 11th, 12th year at this point being yeah, pro? This, is, this would be 12. This would be 12. And so, um, I mean, I can just point at this shirt right here, Sherwood Football. Uh, Sherwood. During my time away from the game, I was able to coach at the high school. And, uh, you know, just being around football for so long, one thing that I thought that I wanted to do was kind of pour into the youth and give them whatever knowledge that I had. And in the span of me doing that, I realized like, yo, there's still something right in this area that I can't quite, you know, quench. I can't quite get get rid of it. And I remember being at one of the practices and, I'm in my sweats and I actually had slippers on because I was like, you know what? I'm not going to put no kind of athletic footwear on because I feel like I might go out here and act like I'm still playing. But I went to show these kids, you know, how to take on a block. And it just kind of <laughs> you go back into that mode, into that zone, you know, and we we were, you know, <clears throat> showing how to shut a drill. And it just was like, oh, like I like that. I miss it. You know, being in the atmosphere, being in the environment. and so. Um, I even tell the kids when I went back a couple weeks ago, like they're part of the factor and the deciding, you know, uh, pieces of to why I, I wanted to come back. Um, having a daughter, one of the things that I realized is, is that, you know, I don't want her to look outside of anybody but this household for a role model. And if I'm telling her you can do anything, you can be all that you can be. And those, you know, nice phrases that we like to use at times, like I got to live it. I got to be exactly what it is that I'm telling her and knowing that there was, like I said, something within me that just quite wasn't done with the football part. I said, you know, we'll see what happens. And it was a hundred percent faith move. Like I had no interest from anybody at the time, you know, I was training, but you know me, I'm an athletic dude. I like to lift anyway. So it wasn't anything football specific, but I remember being at a great cup event that the Thai cats had asked me to come to. And I texted my mom and my wife in a group chat. And I was just like, you know, um, I'm just trusting that this is the move that I'm supposed to make. And, you know, I'm going to put my faith, you know, with actions and see where it leads. And slowly but surely, I I end up signing with the Argos. And, you know, we're here at this point where I'm in a position to continue to give back in a way that I didn't think I could and be able to play ball as well. So. Well, so first, I want to just picture you at a high school practice deciding (laughs) that you want to play again. And whoever that poor kid uh, is that had to step in first to do the drill, I could just oh, imagine man. they he's <laughs> showing how to take on block, probably throwing a couple kids on the ground before you go. Okay. By accident, it wasn't on purpose. But no, I think <laughs> the one thing that that the kids realized is is that like if you're gonna do something, you got to do it 100. percent And that's what I wanted to get across to them. Like we're not out here half stepping. We don't do things half heartedly. If you're committing as a man and you give your word to something, practice like we said understanding assignments and playing for the man next to you, then we do it hundred percent. And that's kind of what I was trying try to get across. And I guess it worked. Uh, it worked well. So. And yeah, okay, coach, listen, I, I know we got to give hundred percent, but how about you dial it back to about 50% <laughs> so we can make that's, it through this yeah. drill? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It's one of those where you catch yourself like, Oh, uh, my bad. I ain't, yeah. I ain't mean to do that right there. <laughs> hey, but that was, I'll tell you what, man, that was a perfect answer for, for you because that's exactly how I figured that your mindset went was, you know what, I got to get back into this because I still got some left. I got to show people that, you know, I'm going to stick by what I said. Um, and I mean, so you, you've raised your family, you know, around the Hamilton area, right? Mm-hmm. You've stayed around for off seasons and stuff like that. Um, that's one thing that I want to talk about with you because there's not a lot of American guys that do that. Right. A lot of American guys go home. They don't really stick around. It's tough. It's tough for an American to stick around. Mm -hmm. the offseason. You got one place to work and that's it. Can't find too much unless you're starting to do stuff on the side, whatever. But 
what was that like in those off seasons as an American trying to stick around, you know, stay a part of the team when we were doing the community events together and yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. And then deciding, um, you know what, I'm going to do this long term. Uh, I mean, to be honest, man, it was seven years ago now. I can't believe I'm saying that, but seven years that uh, I felt like the tie cast had made an investment in me. We had just talked and I had just signed an extension and my previous career in the NFL, I felt like there were certain things that as a man and I was maturing that I didn't do. And one of the things that I wanted this team to know was, is that I was committed, that I was here and that it wasn't just a fly by night. I'm here to get what I can get from you guys and I'm gone. Um, I wanted to use my platform and I wanted to use, you know, everything that I had at my disposal as far as resources to give back to a town and a city that gave me so much at a point in my life where I was really really at rock bottom, if we're being honest. And so for me, it was really a no brainer. The way I've been raised, like I said, talking about giving hundred percent and being fully committed. I felt like that was the step that I needed to take as a man and being mature, but then also to, like I said, be a part of the team outside of football, allow people to understand who I was without a helmet on um, and just build that relationship and camaraderie across the board. And so that's one thing that I appreciate about my time in Hamilton was the community events that we always did, uh, how plugged in they were and allowing us as players to uh, show our face and show a different side of who we were as people and not just as players. So, uh, yeah, it was seven years ago that I decided to move into a little condo up there off of Hessen King and commit to, you know, being here yeah, at the time, <laughs> at the time it was rocking. You had a different <laughs> life. Yeah. But, um, yeah. And it, it was, it was fun, but it was difficult. Right. And I think that that's what allowed me to understand, like, yo, you commit to something, you you're in it through thick and thin. So like, there's times that I was walking in the snow to get to workouts. There's times that I'm biking in the rain to get there. But like I said, the commitment aspect was something that I wanted to show not only the team, but myself. Like I said, I was at a space in my life where I needed to mature as a man. And this was the opportunity that I felt like I could use to do that. And, and why? So you talk about maturing. Was that because, um, you know, maybe was it the move from the NFL to the CFL? It's like, hey, what am I doing here? Or was it other stuff that was going on? It was. It was kind of not a, hey, what am I doing here? But I just felt like. I had an opportunity that I didn't take as much from that I could have. You know, I was a young kid. I got drafted at 21. I'm making the most money I've ever made in my life. I'm in the Big Apple. And I came from a, not a small town, but like where I played college at was Colonial Williamsburg, like where they got horses and buggies and cobblestone roads. And I think our undergrad was 5,000. So to go from that to there, it was really like uh, a deer in the headlights and not to say that I went and I squandered my opportunity, but looking back as we always do sometimes with, you know, things being 2020 in hindsight, I realized there were certain aspects and certain points that I didn't take the most advantage of that I could have. And I remember between my time in the NFL and coming up to the CFL, I had uh, a season off. I had a lot of workouts, but I wasn't on an active roster with anybody. And so I remember having a conversation with myself and God and being like, if I'm ever in a position of having a platform, if I'm ever in a position of being back at that type of level, like I promise that I won't, I won't squander it. You know, I won't waste it. And so that was another reason why my commitment, I said, as far as maturing and understanding what it is that I have with being a professional athlete and especially at the CFL, I didn't want it to be another repeat so I was in that space mentally and like I said it allowed me to mature and allowed me to kind of show people because I mean we can even be completely transparent when I came up here I was a, I wasn't the nicest guy I don't know if you know when I came off the bus I got into it with the offensive coordinator the offensive line coach and our coach at the time Ken Austin was there and I just remember us getting into an argument and in my head I <laughs> I saw him out the corner of my eye and I was like, well, either you here or you're not here. Like you about to get cut today after <laughs> practice or, you know, they can see something in you that you can't see in yourself. So that was another reason why I said like this city, this community, this organization had given me an opportunity that I didn't want to waste. And so, yeah, I, I have a lot of love for Hamilton and, and what is, what is given me. Yeah. And I mean, that kind of, 
you know, that just kind of shows what kind of person you are, though. Like I said, it's the, the only thing that I can explain when I talk about you as a person is just competitor. Right. And yeah, you yeah. had to dial that back a little bit every now and then. Yeah. So does everybody. Right. But you talked about, you know, committing to Hamilton at the time to try to like, you know, push everything forward and, and get your feet planted. The biggest thing that I want to know is from you, especially um, having Americans stick around in the off season, I feel is absolutely massive for the CFL, but Correct me if I'm wrong. A lot of these commitment things we're talking about don't happen on the contract side, right? We're talking oh, yeah. these one year contracts all the time. Mm-hmm. And when you're, when you're an American and you're trying to travel back and forth, you got some family back home and you're bouncing between teams because you're just like, listen, I got to make more money than rookie minimum mm-hmm. because it's just mm-hmm. not helping me float. I feel like, and again, I, I know you think about this stuff a lot. Um, if, if we had longer contracts or maybe something put in place where it's like, you know what, I'm going to commit to you for a couple of years. You think more Americans would stay up here or do you think it'd be the same situation with them going home and, and, you know, kind of bouncing back and forth? I mean, the biggest thing is, is investment, you know, like you said, the commitment aspect I think is extremely important. And I invested my time. I invested my body. I invested, you know, the things that I had as far as my resources, into the team and all you want to do is see that reciprocated. But sometimes, like you said, the nature of the business is the nature of the business. And at the end of the day, just like we talk X's and O's, sometimes to them it's just dollars and cents. And so for me, like I said before, my commitment, I realized had to be outside of what may be normal. You know, you got Americans that are sometimes here for one year, two years, and then they're gone to another team or they're trying to get back down South for an opportunity. And, I think a lot of that contributes to the fact that, like you said, there's nothing long term. There's nothing here that is holding them or allowing them to see the benefit of being here. Like I personally had to have conversations with my my family and like I said, with myself and realize, like, okay, this is my commitment. And I was always under the impression that, you know, if you work hard, then, you know, your efforts will be rewarded. And in some way, shape, or form, they have been. Has it always been financial? No, but I have great relationships. I'm, I'm talking to two individuals right here who, if I didn't come to Canada and stay and be committed, I wouldn't know. You know, I'm talking about the opportunity to be on the PA and represent, you know, the league as a whole, but more specifically Americans who are in my position because I've, I've literally touched every part of the roster. I started on practice mm-hmm. roster. I came up, I worked my way into a starting role, and then it started, went into like more of a rotational type thing. but my investment I realized was going to be outside of money and dollars and cents for the young guys that are coming up here. All they want is an opportunity. And sometimes that's here. Sometimes as you see with other leagues going on down South is there, but no matter where the opportunity presents itself, they want to be wanted somewhere, right? Mm -hmm. They want to feel like there's an investment, there's a commitment outside of dollars and cents outside of what I can do on the field. And if we can find a way to do that, I think that you'll see more longevity and commitment from Americans and even from from Canadians as well. Right. Like, I don't want to just make this one sided and say only Americans. It's more prevalent with Americans. But, you know, we have especially with the COVID year and people having to make decisions on a family side or on a business side that may have been one or two years in that had to hang them up for whatever reason. And I'm not saying, like I said, it has to be a financial commitment, but there has to be something greater that ties us to whatever, you know, team or organization we're with at the time for, I think, to have us to have the longevity that we're, we're seeking. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. I think, you know, the one year contracts are great because everybody hits free agency can, you know, make their money and stuff like that. But what we're seeing now is that everyone's hitting free agency. So now it's actually working against us. And now exactly. nobody, unless you had, you know, the best season at your position, Mm -hmm. uh, those are the only ones making the money. I mean, you know, better than I do. The one thing that I can appreciate is stability. You want to go somewhere where you feel comfortable. You understand the coaching staff, the scheme. You're familiar with, you know, the front office personnel. You're familiar with, you know, even the operations side. You know, it's it's a family that you're trying to build. It's a culture that you're trying to change. And that's hard to do if one year you're here with the next you're not. 
So like I said, it's more than just a dollars and cents thing. I think it's more of if we look at it from, like I said, the, the, the cultural aspect, like what are we trying to do? What are we trying to build? What are we trying to create? Like we had Coach O, who's one of the greatest leaders I've ever been around. And that's the one thing that he tries to do is establish a culture of what it's going to be like here. And in order to do that, you need stability. And that's why you sometimes mm-hmm. see certain players that keep coming back, keep resigning because there's something there that they can appreciate. And I think a lot of that has to do with the stability. Yeah, I, I absolutely agree. And I guess, you know, going through this again, you're heading into another CBA. Are you still involved PA right now, even jumping back in to playing? Or? Uh, not officially. Uh, I don't have any title with them, but I do try to keep, you know, my, my finger on the pulse to understand what's mm-hmm. going on because it does directly affect me now that I'm back in it. Um, but not only just for me, it's more so, for the future of this league and how I feel like there's so much untapped potential and there's so many things that can be done to allow this league to be one of the most dominant leagues in North America, not just in Canada and North America, as far as the talent that we have, as far as the game itself mm-hmm. and how exciting it is. I remember that first game I went back to watching the NFL and I was like, yo, this is boring. Like, this is slow. Yeah, it's extremely predictable. Yeah. Like, two minutes to go in the game, you're already like, all right, I'm like, all right, let's go. They're like, no, we still got two minutes. I'm like, this is this is what's going to happen. Boop, 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 bop, 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 do, do, do. And, then, <laughs> and that's exactly what happened, and it was over. And I'm like, yo, like, if you guys would just tap into Canadian football and understand, like, the rouge, understand – uh, the size of the field, the waggle, all these different aspects of the game that give it that exciting entertainment factor. Like you would, you would either like it as much as the NFL, or you might even put the NFL in a secondary position. But yeah, I, I just have a lot of love for the game because of what it's given to me. And this is just football in general, but specifically the CFL, understanding, like I said, a lot of the potential that has yet to be tapped in on the on the game side, but then also with the plethora of players that we have who have amazing stories, who have amazing talents, who have amazing interests that I think would just allow the league as a whole to just grow and develop in a way we've never seen before. And that's the biggest thing. I mean, I I talked about this a couple of times on different episodes that we've had. And, you know, you see what Ottawa is doing with the behind the R thing. I I mean, come on. He's doing arrow up and now Edmonton's got their own. Honestly, the best thing I think we've ever done was to peer pressure organizations into creating better content by having one of them just jump out and be like, screw it. We'll just do it. Cause yeah. as soon as one team did it, everybody else was like, Oh shit. People actually like this. Damn it. <laughs> yeah. Duh. Like, yeah. People have been watching <laughs> would, 30 for 30 forever. <laughs> you know, <laughs> but that's but the thing. We got to, yeah. Go we got to talk about the players, man. That's the, who's, who's in there right now. You got to talk about the players. Got to show them what they're doing. Hey, get a couple cameras to follow you around while you're on Hamilton bike share at the beginning of your career at Hamilton, <laughs> ripping down the bike lanes to head in for a workout. That's yes, what we indeed. need. You know what I mean? Turning left. Turning left. <laughs> Watch out. <laughs> no, but I mean, I think that's one of the reasons why I wanted to come here. Like I said, get involved in the community because a lot of people don't know who's under the helmet. Like they're not yeah. that close on a consistent basis to be like, oh, that's such and such. Oh, that's such and such. Da, 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 da. But like you said, if we invest in the players, a product, I think that you'll see leaps and bounds what what this league can can ascend to. Absolutely, and and you hit it, hit it right on that. I mean, we gotta you gotta get what's under the helmet. Yeah. People have to start really knowing what the player is about because then that makes them stick around. And you, you tie that in with you know more commitment, right? Like you were saying, and now all of a sudden you have people showing up buying jerseys people complain about buying jerseys because the player is going to leave well that starts from what you guys are doing right now arguing yeah. with the cba right doing that whole thing again and i mean listen i'll give my perspective on it and then i want you to give yours on this whole cba thing but mm-hmm. i mean over the gosh four or five that i've been a part of at this point um it's just it starts to wear on you you know what I mean? When you're trying to work these things out, it almost seems like it's just, it's not a fair relationship between yeah. the player and the CFL. It's just, it's really frustrating being, you know, in a training camp atmosphere in meeting saying, Hey, are we going to go to practice tomorrow? Or is there nothing that's going to be worked out? 
and you're sitting there going, well, I guess we got to give up this, this, and this again. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's just, it's not a fair situation, but I want to get your perspective on it because when, when they talked about the PA, I learned early on and just decided to stick with it that I'm staying out of this because yeah, it's a disaster. Yeah, it's, it's very difficult. And I think it's difficult because a lot of things, and this is just my personal opinion, yeah. are established on privilege and not principle, right? I think principle are things that, irregardless of what era we're in, they stand the test of time. There's just certain things that we understand and that we're going to be committed to, and that's just what it is. And the one thing that I think is completely unfair is, like you said, there's no resemblance of a partnership. It doesn't seem like behind the scenes, like we know what goes on on social media and certain images that have to be um, upheld. But when we actually talk about the nitty gritty and we're having the real conversations in the trenches, partnership is far from what I would say characterizes the relationship that the players have with the league. And it really is unfortunate because at the end of the day, that's all that we're seeking as players is to be seen as equals from the standpoint of what we provide to the league. I mean, at the end of the day, we're the product, you know, and we understand that there's other things that go into allowing us to be that. And we're not sitting here and we're not negating those facts. But at the same time, we need our, our just do, you know, it's our livelihood. Mm -hmm. This is the way that a lot of us, especially now that I'm referring to the Americans, you know, are making, are making money. And at a certain point, it has to be said, like, these are the things that we're going to stand on. These are the things that we believe in. And irregardless of how things have been in the past, this is how it has to be moving forward. Or else there's going to be no change. There's going to continue to be the whole, let me shake your hand, but behind my back, I'm holding, you know, whatever, whatever, choose your weapon of choice. <laughs> you know, and it's unfortunate. And that's the one thing that, I've realized as I've gotten older, I mean, I've been playing ball. Well, we won't even get into how old I am, but I've been playing it for a while. (laughs) And it's unfortunate how, you know, going in little league and playing the love that you have for the game, right? That's where my competitive comes from. I actually started playing ball because my friends played, not because like, I was like, Ooh, football. I love it. I just loved competing. And that's what all my boys were doing. So that's what we did. But that love, that passion, that drive, as you get older, gets overshadowed by the business and that's the part that's unfortunate and a lot of fans don't understand because they're still looking at it as a standpoint of entertainment and us as players as we sit and we're having these conversations and as completely one-sided are looking at it as our livelihood Mm -hmm. like this is how we provide this is how we keep the lights on put food on the table and so it's upsetting and frustrating when you look at it from that point but then I have to play devil's advocate and put my hat on from the business side. And it's just, that's just what they do. You know, that's just the machine. That's just the beast. And at the end of the day, in order for them to make a profit, they're going to have to try to skimp and cut and, you know, do what they need to do on their, on their end. And I respect that, but that doesn't mean that that's the way it's supposed to be. You know, there's a lot of successful leagues all across the world, but even the one that we're trying to walk in their footsteps of as far as the NFL and certain business models, that that's not what you see, right? You have a lot of players and unions in a position of being at least more equal than what we are. And that's all that we're seeking. We're not seeking anything that's outrageous. We're not out here asking for million dollar contracts. We're just asking for stability. (laughs) And we're asking for you know, uh, a, a chance to not have to worry about every year, or every two years, whether or not, like you said, we're striking. The last CBA that we had that I was a part of, we literally said, yo, we're striking. Yeah. And That's crazy. <laughs> the next day we were supposed to have a training camp. And it was wild to see. And then we get a call as PA reps an hour later. Oh, we signed a deal. Oh, we're back on. Like, thank God it came through. But like, why would that be the nature of business of a professional league? And that's my thing. If we're hanging our hats on being professional, if we're hanging our hats on being a league that's trying to compete with other professional leagues that we see at a certain level, then we've got to throw away the privilege and understand the principles that they're established on so that we can abide in those ways. So that's just my two cents and how I feel about it. Uh, I'm in a PA. I fight for my guys no matter what. 
when I was in it. If I'm fortunate enough to be on it this year, I'll do the same. But like I said, that's because I love the game. I love people. And I see, like I said, the potential of where this can be. And we're not even scratching the surface yet. And, and I love it, man, because that's exactly what we need as players, right? Is we need people like you that are going to do that. And, you know, like I said, competitive, man. It's It comes <laughs> out it comes out in absolutely everything. But listen, I, I don't – I honestly – I want to be respectful of your time, and I know you're working on tummy time right now with your daughter. So I don't <laughs> want to take – I don't want to take too much time for me. But nah, listen, no I just want to say – I want to say thank you for coming on for real. We could have, you know, a three-hour podcast with you on this, and I think it would be awesome. But These William um, & Mary Argos can talk, eh? These William <laughs> & yeah, Mary Argonauts yeah. guys? Damn. <laughs> yeah. But, man, I and I also – I also cannot wait to watch you play because I know oh, that, man, it, you know, there won't be a misstep, maybe a little rust on your first pass rush move, but by the second one, you'll be fine. Ah, you know, uh, it's, it's amazing, right? Been training and been working out and I'm looking at guys who are 10 years younger, which is blowing my mind. Right. Cause I remember looking at Justin Tuck and OC Manier like, ah, but now I'm that guy. <laughs> But one thing that I can appreciate about, you know, being a professional and committing to this craft is it's like riding a bike. You know, Come once you back. get back on and you start pedaling, you get that natural feeling back and and you're back in the groove. And I got a great, great bunch of guys around me supporting me, have been all off season and can't wait to strap it up and, and get to it. But uh, man, Daly, I just appreciate you. Appreciate the teammates you've been to me. Appreciate the man you are. Kind of walking in your footsteps now. After seeing you get married and seeing you have kids. And uh, it's amazing. It's a beautiful journey. Uh, and Marsh, man, you out there tapping into something that I might want to do yep. once I'm done with my career. And hey, anytime and you want to get in the booth with me, you're more than welcome, man. I mean, the way hey, that you I carry don't, I, don't, I don't know. I don't want to talk too much, man. You see me <laughs> I can sometimes just take it and go with it. But yeah, man, I appreciate you and, and how Thank professional you. you are and what it is that you do and, and being top notch. So you guys, if it's been a pleasure. I was humbled when I got the text and I, I couldn't say anything but yes to, to sitting down with you guys. Well, I, well I you're got, welcome anytime, man. Anytime. I, I got two things to say on the way out here. One, I don't know why Daly's complaining about people wanting to buy jerseys. There's so many goddamn 35 jerseys in the stands <laughs> in Hamilton because they know that dude wasn't going anywhere for a straight decade. And the second, oh, the second thing is, I actually heard that when Adrian wanted to go to the Argonauts, he asked for the Rocket Ismail contract, which was the eighteen point two million over four years. That's what I heard. Yeah, but yeah, I, I like I it. I don't know if they landed the Rocket money for you, AD. That's See, that's how we got the barn door behind them. I'm telling you, <laughs> those things aren't barn cheap now. Door. <laughs> I got my stone fireplace. <laughs> I got my soaker tub upstairs. You you don't you hey you don't know what's going over here in the hammer now. And I know the nursery. <laughs> I know the nursery has got to be perfect, right? Oh, it's decked out. Yeah. Anything for my princess, man. My little baby. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Trace. We appreciate you, man. No, appreciate thank you, guys. You,